गुड इवनिंग गायस जस्ट गिव मी अ थम्स अप इफ द ऑडियो विजुअल इज वर्किंग वेल यू कैन सी माई पॉइंटर यू कैन सी द बोर्ड एंड यू कैन हियर माई वॉइस क्लियरली so then just have the thumbs up if the audio visual is working okay so people who are watching who are in please just give me that nod so that i know that everything is okay and we can just proceed all right okay fine enough so that's my pointer here perfect enough so i think things looking good enough so we are in a state to begin so i can see the chat box also clearly wonderful okay so just a quick introduction of myself first please dr mukul mohendra your orthopedic instructor here at an academy and perhaps you know why i am here today because i wish to take up the small area um, bone infections just give you a quick overview on it and the idea is that you know at least we seal one question from this particular topic hardly you will find any exam where at least a question from the bone infections is not there so this is a special session i have dedicated to the upcoming fmg exam so that i pack up a question and put it into your backs so people watching without wasting much of time i think we can just get going we can just get going so meanwhile i hope you guys are all in everything is okay the audio visual is going well uh just just raise your thumb in the chat box to let me know that you are in and everything is okay fine so so just beginning this small discussion on bone infections what you call it osteomyelitis so osteo would mean bone and myle would mean marrow so to be specific when you find infection in the bone and in the marrow that's exactly where we use this word osteomyelitis so it means infection in the bone and in the marrow when you talk of osteomyelitis bone infection usually the cause would be staph aureus so that's the commonest source you know that leads to eventually bone infections staph aureus most of the times but i would just like to take you through some special scenarios now just in case you've been asked the commonest cause of bone infections in hiv patients so what do you think would be the answer in this particular scenario would it be the same staph aureus or would it be the staph epidermidis in hiv or no hiv people it, it, it's actually pseudomonas or no it's streptococcus pneumoniae so people watching please drop in your answers no negative marking in my class i always encourage you to answer even if you answer it in an incorrect manner because i always say that a mistake here would become a memory so please put in your 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 choices what do you think would be the answer okay so please quickly sign into chat put in your answers please let me know that what do you think would usually be the cause in case of hiv patients okay shake says b epidermidis oh uh, no you've been actually trapped here you've just been you know bothered a little bit by this word hiv actually even here the answer is staph aureus so staph aureus tends to be even the predominant cause in people with hiv infections so i know you would like to then know then what are the exceptional situations where the cause is not staph aureus So, Dr. Rishpal, you were right that you know it's staph aureus in HIV, but I'll definitely like to brief you on what are the exceptions. So, in case you have been asked the commonest cause in IV drug abusers, here you can put it as pseudomonas in IV drug abusers, not in HIV in IV drug abusers. In case you've been asked the commonest cause in people who have sickle cell disease. here you can put the answer as salmonella in case you been asked about the commonest cause of infections in the bone in people who have an animal bite here you will put it as pasteurella 
and just in case you've been asked about the commonest cause of bone infections in people who have had a human bite even this happens at times that will be eye canella so only these would be taken as exceptions every other case the answer has to be staph aureus may it be hiv may it be immunocompromised may it be diabetics it has to be staph aureus so please be very clear fine so iv drug users it will be pseudomonas hiv patients immunocompromised it will be staph aureus clear siddharth fine so any takers for this any takers for this question the commonest cause of infection in prosthetic joints i hope you understood what is meant by prosthetic joints a total hip replacement has been done a total knee replacement has been done so when a replacement arthroplasty has been done so what do you think would generally lead to bone infections so when a replacement arthroplasty has been done okay krishna says it's pseudomonas epidermidis okay wonderful sada so you are spot on this time you're right it is epidermidis so overall this tends to be the commonest cause in prosthetic joints well let me be very clear and specific if there is an acute infection after a replacement arthroplasty that's staph aureus chronic infections epidermidis but epidermidis also tends to be there in some cases of acute infection so overall it is epidermidis that is com more commonly isolated than staph aureus clear guys so here will be staphy staph epidermidis in prosthetic joints so you are very much familiar with uh with the uh etiology behind bone infections i would just like to brief you a little bit regarding the classification part also now this osteomyelitis that involves the bone it generally involves the metaphyseal area so the part of the bone that is involved by the bone infections generally tends to be metaphyses and this metaphyseal area infection we classify it in this manner acute osteomyelitis sub acute osteomyelitis and chronic osteomyelitis now in acute osteomyelitis the duration of symptoms would span less than 2 weeks in sub acute that would span between 2 to 4 weeks and in chronic infection chronic osteomyelitis the symptoms would be going beyond 1 month more than 4 weeks so that's a very simple way you know to segregate osteomyelitis into three categories okay so siddharth uh, epidermidis will not be acute well let me be clear the standard classification we follow for bone infections in orthopedics after arthroplasty that's a sukayamital classification so that says up to 1 month is taken as acute and 1 month is enough for biofilm formation okay so beyond 1 month we take it as delayed and beyond any we take it as a chronic one okay so as per the classification epidermidis fits into some cases of acute infection this classification is devised more in terms of the management part to help you out with it because before one month we can retain the prosthesis but in infections that occur once more than a month has gone we have to generally remove the prosthesis clear enough with your query also siddharth all right okay now another one for you so moving on to bit of clinical pattern questions because that's been the new take for the fmgs they are getting now also questions based on clinical scenarios so 17 years old male he's come to you and he's given you that two weeks history of an intermittent fever now he says he used to go for a jog every morning and his left knee has been hurting him a bit now straight away says that the pain did not respond to analgesics so that's why he thought of meeting a doctor because most of the people would self medicate after reading google and that would do half of their job now since he's come to you because his pain is not responding you examined him and on examination you find proximal tibia to be tender so there is something wrong with the proximal tibia in this case now fortunately the x-ray of the patient is given to you and the examiner has not mentioned about the finding here like what is seen on the x-ray so even give simply given you the x-ray and he wants to see the x-ray and correlate the history and then get the answer here 
so you have to tell me the likely possibility here looking at the x-ray so this is the lesion that you can see over here clearly okay so Siddharth says Brody's abscess or Rishpal Brody's abscess I'll take it up perfect enough so even that will be my answer here in this this particular question but you know whenever you get clinical MCQs my advice is always to rule out other options like why not other options are correct so we go one by one so how do I cross out acute osteomyelitis first thing the duration of symptoms would generally be less than two weeks here it's a little more than two weeks as clearly mentioned to you now in acute osteomyelitis the patient would generally be toxic there will be high grade fever raised blood counts you know lethargic patient toxic patient this gentleman does not look toxic he's been jogging around so that also takes away acute osteomyelitis and then let me tell you even if you ask me the commonest site where you get acute osteomyelitis it's actually distal femur and what's been shown over here is tibia so fairly good reasons for me to believe that this is not acute osteomyelitis so could it be chronic osteomyelitis i would say again no because chronic osteomyelitis the duration of symptoms have to cross four weeks it's not been that scenario in chronic osteomyelitis clinically you find the patient to have a sinus pus would be coming out of the bone out of the skin and there could be discharge of the bony spicules as well so that sinus formation is not mentioned over here either okay and then let me tell you even the x-ray findings are very different because what you may see in the x-ray in acute osteomyelitis is that characteristic periosteal reaction and what you may find in an x-ray of chronic osteomyelitis either a sequestrum or what we call as a moth eaten appearance I'll just show you the two things see what happens in cases of acute osteomyelitis now infection is coming to the bone via the bloodstream now in the metaphyseal area you have this hairpin arrangement of blood vessels that leads to stasis of blood flow so pus forms in the metaphyseal area now this pus expands expands and this pus lifts the periosteum from the surface of bone now there is an innate response in the body that whenever periosteum is lifted up from the bone there is new bone formation under the periosteum this new bone formation that you can see under the periosteum is exactly what I have been calling as periosteal reaction diagnostic to say this is acute osteomyelitis and I hope you can see there is a bit of haziness here like see haziness around the femur but see no haziness around the tibia so this haziness is from increased blood flow so this is what you would generally find in x-rays of acute osteomyelitis around distal femur mostly because that's the commonest site but when you go to chronic osteomyelitis you will find a cavity containing a dead piece of bone this is sequestrum this could be what you may find in the early stages but just in case you click an x-ray a little bit about too late you find the whole bone distorted eaten up by infection and that's what you call as chronic a uh, moth eaten appearance classical of a chronic osteomyelitis so clear enough guys with the x-ray picture in the two scenarios in acute and in chronic osteomyelitis so that x-ray appearance is also not matching so I can safely rule out these two conditions and I don't think I need to tell you how did I rule out osteoidosteoma how did I rule out osteoidosteoma so few people who can tell me couple of points that tell me that this is not osteoidosteoma yes so Siddharth this video will be uploaded on YouTube okay 
this video will be uploaded on YouTube and you can assess it later also in the recorded format. Fine. So people who can help me out that why this is not osteoidosteoma? Because that could very well be another possible choice. All right. So first thing, osteoid osteoma would mean a diaphyseal lesion. And in osteoid osteoma, you tend to find a diagnostic response to aspirin. So that's not there, not responding to analgesics. So that's what tells me this is broad sepsis. And then let me tell you, most common site for broad sepsis again tends to be proximal tibia. So undoubtedly, this is broad sepsis. Clear enough, guys? So I hope enough to tell you the correct answer here. Just a word about these types of sequestra that you may have in cases of chronic osteomyelitis. Tubular sequestra you generally find when you deal with a pyogenic osteomyelitis and this is standard. This is a tubular sequestra. Characteristic of pyogenic osteomyelitis. The ring sequestra you generally found around the amputation stumps or around the external fixator pins. A feathery sequestrum is generally seen in cases of viral osteomyelitis and that's a feather-like sequestrum you see in this x-ray in a cavity. Fine, uh, feathery sequestrum, sorry, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll just correct myself. Sorry, I'll just correct myself. This will be tubercular osteomyelitis. Fine sandy sequestrum you see in viral osteomyelitis. Black sequestrum that's classical of actinomycosis and Bombay sequestrum when the bone has had an exposure to hydrogen sulfide. So please do remember about these types of sequestra because sometimes they can simply be an MCQ in your exam and you may lose a point over like nothing. Particularly important is ring sequestrum and that's what a ring sequestrum looks like. You can just have a good look. You never know when an image comes in your exam. Fine enough guys. So moving a little further and asking you a little bit about the treatment that you follow in cases of chronic osteomyelitis. Now there's a patient who has got chronic osteomyelitis and the x-ray of the patient is shown here. I hope you can see a cavity and inside this cavity I hope you can see there's a chip of bone that is sequestrum. So that is the dead piece of bone, the food of the bacteria. So not a part of treatment in cases of chronic osteomyelitis. So Siddharth, Tadrishpal, Krishna, and any, anyone, anyone who wishes to comment. <clears throat> so no negative marking in my class, I always say. Yes. So anyone who wishes to help me out with it. So what do you think would be the ideal treatment for a case of chronic osteomyelitis in DTBI like I've shown over here in this x-ray? So what do you think does not need to be done? Okay, or, 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 or let me tell you how do we treat chronic osteomyelitis. Well, first of all, kyphoplasty. What does this mean? This is basically a surgery for osteoporotic vertebral compression fractures fine so 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 kyphoplasty is no rule over here that's out and that's the answer that's the answer but how come kyphoplasty is given here in like one of the choice i'll tell you that up so how do you manage chronic osteomyelitis? Now in chronic osteomyelitis, the infection is you know stuck into the bone because it has a home, this cavity. And it has this food inside this cavity that is sequestrum. So first thing that is need to be done, sequestrectomy. To remove sequestrum. Now after this, what needs to be done is saucerization. Saucerization means de-roof the cavity so how do we de-roof the cavity i'll just do it for you i'll just do it for you so i am just going to remove this one wall of the cavity like this so so i'm just you know simulating as if i'm doing a sequestrectomy here and a saucerization 
so what i have done over here is basically i have removed one roof of this cavity for you to show you what is saucerization so please just have a look here you will be able to see very clearly now that i have removed this roof so that cavity that was here has been converted into a saucer so whatever discharge will be collecting here will be flowing out of the bone so nothing will now be able to stay inside the bone so the infection will go so this removal of the roof is what we call as saucerization plus in these cases you have to give iv antibiotics for at least a period of 6 weeks so this is what comprises the treatment in cases of chronic osteomyelitis you have to do sequestrectomy saucerization plus iv antibiotics now if you want you can fill this cavity because after saucerization you have you know made the bone go so thin you have created this cavity here so you can fill cavity with a substance that we call as bone cement so because of this bone cement here i think uh, this choice kyphoplasty has been there i'll tell you how see bone cement is a chemical that has this formula polymethyl methacrylate pmma now orthopedic surgeons are just the refined version of the carpenters they have the same screw same drill machine same everything they have the same type of cement you mix with water it dries this bone cement the setting time is approximately 10 minutes a repeat question from one of the previous exams so you can fill it use it to fill small cavities so specifically the uses you know we uh, for for which we use this bone cement one is in infections and tumors to fill small cavities like i've just showed you after saucerization we use it in kyphoplasty because in kyphoplasty we inject this bone cement into the vertebras so that is why i think you know because of cement being a common thing maybe kyphoplasty is a treatment option you know an option here bone cement can also be used to fill small defects in bones like we have done over here okay and bone cement is used for fixation of prosthesis in replacement surgeries so that's another very very important use of this substance called bone cement so please do note down some important information on bone cement because at times questions have come upon this particular part and i must tell you that this bone cement when you put it it is visible on the x ray because it contains a radioactive substance that is barium sulfate mcq so the radio opaque substance present in the bone cement is barium sulfate that helps you to trace this bone cement even on the x rays clear enough guys one last one one last one but my favorite one so 6 years old boy he's come to your emergency department and his complaint is a painful limp you went ahead with the clinical examination and you find that there is tenderness in the femoral triangle there is some limitation of the hip movements also there so there is a painful limp in 6 years old boy and is come to you in the emergency with tenderness in front of the hip and there is limitation of hip movements to some extent you've gone through the x-ray that's normal so what do you think should be your next plan of action yes so so in a simple way you know what i wish to ask you guys the commonest cause of limp in a child under the age of 10 years so think about this in your mind and then answer okay so so most of you are inclined to go with mri 
I would differ here. I would say admit for observation. That is the better answer. And I'll tell you how. See, for this you need to be clear about a condition that's called transient synovitis. So I think that's what you know the diagnosis here actually. Transient synovitis. Transient synovitis. Now this term is synonymous with this word observation hip or, or some people also call it as like irritable hip. So what's the basic picture here? You have a child who's generally between this age of 4 to 10 years. The mean age you can take it to be around 6 years. Okay. Now this child, he's had a minor trauma or maybe a minor viral infection, cough, cold or something. After this, he's landed up with synovitis, synovial inflammation in the hip. 95% cases, it's unilateral. A single hip is only involved. Now because of this temporary type of synovitis, the clinical feature with which you know the cell would be coming to you, one would be fever that will be generally less than 38.5 degrees centigrade. But his complaint would generally be this painful limp. If you just examine this child, you will find the limp limb to be placed in this position flexion abduction external rotation because in this position you have maximum joint space so minimum pain the x-ray would be totally normal and the inflammatory markers like ESR, CRP, TLC, TLC normal that's generally the scenario in uh, you know transient synovitis so this boy seems to be a case of this observation hip transient synovitis so i'm admitting now there were people answering it as mri there were ans people answering that next thing should be ultrasound or anything else so i'll let you know when you think it is transient synovitis the two most important differential diagnoses you have to consider you have to keep in your mind that this might not be a case of septic arthritis okay or this might not be a case of parthes disease an avn that involves femoral head in this age group 4 to 10 years so these are the possibilities you have to keep in mind in case you know you are having this kind of a question so it could be transient synovitis could be septic arthritis could be parthes disease now let us suppose this was a case of septic arthritis so this would have been my choice here going with ultrasonography to see pus in the joint and aspirating the pus and just in case my diagnosis here would have been this is a case of parthes disease mri would have been my next investigation because to see avian in the bone mri would be the best but here looking at the history, I am more inclined towards transient synovitis. So I am preferring this. Admit. So guys, let me tell you how come the other differentials are not looking so strong here. Now had this been a case of septic arthritis, fever would have definitely been mentioned by the examiner because that would have certainly crossed 38.5 degrees Celsius something would have been mentioned about the inflammatory markers because they would have certainly been drastically raised and then let me tell you the classical finding here all movements in the joint generally go extremely painful if it is septic arthritis so let me go back and show you that there is just some limitation of the movements. So that clearly tells me this is not septic arthritis. So that ultrasonography, that aspiration of the hip is actually out. Now, 
if I say that this is Perthes disease, almost in 30% of the cases this would be bilateral. And here it is the single hip involved. Had it been bilateral, I could have thought more in terms of Perthes because, because uh, you know, uh, Perthes 30% could be bilateral. Now in Perthes disease again, there is no fever, nothing at all because simply avian of the femoral head. But in Perthes disease, generally you know the course is protracted means symptoms would be spanning longer how if it is parthes the symptoms would be generally beyond a duration of six weeks and if it is a case of transient synovitis the symptoms would be generally less than a period of six weeks so here that you know prolonged history is not mentioned because it's clearly written that this has just come to you in the emergency department it's a kind of an acute onset okay so that also somewhere tells me you know that it's likely not a case of Perthes disease because because person comes to you with to you in the emergency you know that means it's a very short onset of symptoms now let me tell you something very strange in around 3% cases, transient synovitis eventually goes on to become Parthes. So, so, so maybe it's an early case of Parthes. So we just admit him for observation. See him over a period of days. We see the fever coming, going higher up. We see the inflammatory markers going up. It is now septic arthritis and now we aspirate and do ultrasound. We think this pain is coming again and again. The limp is not going. The course has crossed six weeks. Now we send him for an MRI. Okay, we think it is Parthes. And just in case we find the other hip also gets involved, we think this is Parthes. So, Dr. Richpal, Uma, Siddharth, Krishna, I hope you guys are thoroughly convinced here with the answer. You understood this question well. You, you are now very much familiar with what is transient synovitis. Fine. So, so that's all from my side for today. So, in case you wish to attend more classes from me, please log on to an academy, subscribe, and in case you want to maximize your benefit, go in with the iconic subscription, an academy prep ladder, both at one go. Just sharing with you some batches coming up with us. The INICT 2022 high yield revision batch just starting July 21. Today is that day. We have a batch targeting FMG 2022. So that's already started quickly, join in fast. There's a NEAT PG 2023 batch also coming up and who knows this is NEAT or may it be the next. So we'll gear you up for both formats of the exams. And for this, you will have to subscribe. The subscription prices, very, very economical there on the website. So you can just pick it up. Uh, in case you wish to avail the special discount, please, now is the time. That's my referral code, Ortho Life. So you can use it and pick it up if you are going in between this time july 17 to july 22 so that's all from my side so just reminding you about the referral code in case you guys enjoyed the class we'll be looking forward to having you as subscribers there on an academy so guys before i finally say good night to you and wish you bye bye for today any 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 queries you wish to ask me or anything that's there in your mind you don't want to carry that home please quickly quickly so so let that query pop out on the chat box so that i can answer all right so no more queries there okay so i suppose things were good enough easy enough for you to understand at least the small area you can see at least one question for your exams so please be thorough with at least the bone infections so hope you enjoyed the session good night for now bye bye